Excellent. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me back. Um, it's always fun to talk with the old guys that uh, you know I was involved with for so many years up in the Boston area. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Christoph Dorbeck. I am a principal solutions architect at, at Red Hat. Uh, today's presentation is not work related, but obviously because I work in technology and with Linux and with Red Hat, um, a lot of my private time, lab work, et cetera, usually turns into something. And then I usually like to share that back with the team here. So one of the projects I've been working on in uh, almost like the, the last year is Ansible. And in particular, I've been working on Ansible playbooks for deploying OpenShift. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm focused on. And although today is not a OpenShift discussion, you know, Kubernetes, I'm wearing my Kubernetes shirt. Um, happy to talk about it, but it's more of a conversation about my journey with Ansible, uh, some of the challenges I ran into, how my playbooks have evolved, what state they're in now, and primarily like what, what can you do with them? So I always begin my presentation with like a short disclosure. So I've already mentioned that uh, I do work for Red Hat slash IBM. Uh, this is not related to my work or my job that I get paid for. Um, and I'm not here representing Red Hat or IBM. This is just personal. And um, you know, this is to exchange ideas and knowledge. So please share your ideas, comments, criticism, what have you. Um, everything's welcome. And uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, before I joined Red Hat, which was already 15 years ago, uh, I spent about 20 years doing Unix system administration in, in various fields of um, retail uh, research, that kind of stuff, oil and gas, financial services. Anyway, so that's a little bit about me. So um, what I'm talking about today is this project that I created called XTOF underscore deploy. Uh, or just Kristoff deploy. And it's called that because I got tired of coming up with cute names for projects that always wound up going into a dead end. And then I spent more time trying to create a persona or PR about something before it actually had any real technical value. So uh, the origin of this whole project kind of began many years ago um, when I had to start creating workshops, kind of hands-on experiences using VMs and using the public cloud, um, I built a set of tools to create what's called a, a blueprint in this environment called Ravello. Ravello was a cloud provider that was eventually acquired by Oracle. And as of about a year ago, two years ago now, uh, Oracle killed Ravello. And I had to exit that platform and find somewhere else to do my work. but when Rebello was there, it was nice because they provided a suitable functional API. I wrote a bunch of Python tools and command lines so that I could basically sit at my laptop and automate the initiation of 10, 50, 100 of these blueprints, which were a collection of VMs, some network setup. And in the cloud, I could basically provision a lab for every individual attendee. Um, it was cool. It was easy from a design perspective. And once it was working, it worked great. But uh, performance was lacking. And some things you could do, some things you couldn't. But for everything that I needed, Morvello was perfect. So in any case, um, when Oracle killed it, I had to find some other place to go. So let's see. Um, so I started building OpenShift deployment automation tools at home. Uh, when OpenShift transitioned from uh, basically when it, around the, the 3.x period. So um, I won't go into the history of, of OpenShift, but OpenShift 3.x was a product based on RHEL, distributed like RHEL. So it was like with RPMs. So if you had entitlements to OpenShift, you would have access to channels. You turn those on through subscription manager or through your satellite. And then you yum install a bunch of stuff. And then you run a fancy install script. And then you watch it run for a couple of hours. And if you got something wrong, you'd have to go touch on a bunch of config files and make sure everything was syntactically correct. And it was very error prone because it was a lot of hand typing, what have you. So automating all that made perfect sense. Um, when OpenShift 4 came around, um, the 
concept of being provisioned on top of RHEL kind of went away, and now OpenShift was provisioned on top of Red Hat Core OS. So different underlying operating system, different way of managing it, different way of updating it. Um, and so automating the deployment kind of took a different approach. And I'll, we'll get into that when the time comes. So at the time I was doing this um, Ansible playbook de deployment uh, work for, for OpenShift, I was also managing other workshops like the RHEL 8 hands-on lab or the RHEL 7 hands-on lab at that time. Uh, I do satellite workshops for provisioning and managing uh, RHEL machines. Um, and so now I was doing basically the same work in three different areas, trying to deploy VMs into libvirt. Um, um, and then I'd make one project work fine, move that stack over to another, another, another workshop and it would break. And so I needed to find a way to kind of unify all three workshops together using the same set of deployment tools. So that became kind of the first effort to extract the, the common components and separate what is deployment versus what is the workshop. Um, and so I extracted those specifics into a separate project, which I at that time named the WS deployer for workshop deployer and then dash KVM because these are the plays for KVM. And then the intent was I would have another workshop deployer for Overt or for AWS or some other platform. Um, yeah, over the course if, of time. If, yeah. If I can interrupt. Sure. Uh, take a look at the last line on your screen. <clears throat> yeah. I think you get a little typo there. Yeah, Max workshop. Where? GitHub. Com. Yeah, it's hard for me to see because I have to go to the YouTube to see your slides. You're, you're talking about the URL? WRT to open shit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know. <laughs> that happens. That, that's, that's probably Google doing a little... Uh, it probably is. It is. Either way, it's not a judgment statement. No, it's not. All right. So let's see, oops, I hit stop sharing instead of sharing. Let's go back to that. All right, present. Okay, we good? All good. Okay, so let me wrap up the history on this slide here. So these playbooks over time, I needed to find a way to integrate them to multiple workshops. And that integration happens through uh, Git submodules. So I have one project for the playbooks related to deployment. I have other projects related to the workshops. And then the workshops basically use a, a Git submodule to incorporate um, those ad additional deployment uh, capabilities. And you'll see exactly how that works when we get there. So finally, all that. Uh, deployment stuff landed in a single code, code base, and then the workshops were separate. So it worked great, uh, but the design of the workshop deployer was very counterintuitive, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it was also difficult to debug. It was impossible to accept contributions from anybody else. It was really hard to explain to other people why some of the design decisions were made that way. Um, and so starting with December 1st, right before Christmas, I took on an effort while there was a slowdown in activity for the holidays to basically redesign and rewrite everything from scratch. So with regard to OpenShift, um, the installation using this tool provided you know, some level of uh, Unix, Linux competency, let's call it two hours. Um, and you'll see exactly what that looks like here in just a second. The actual deploy time uh, for the environment that I'm going to show you is about 30 minutes. All right. So what was right or wrong with uh, the workshop deployer? Um, well, it began with my first attempt at writing a rather large Ansible project. So you know, I've been trained. I've been shown how Ansible works. But a lot of the things that you think or you your bias, the, how you conceive things work, uh, all that falls apart when you really hit the, uh, the wall on trying to program with Ansible versus just letting Ansible do its automation. Um, so you really need to learn how to hate Ansible before you 
kind of have your epiphany moment and then you start over and then everything it's glorious so on the journey Basically, you start with playbooks, which are pretty simple. You break up a goal into a series of tasks. You write a playbook, and you feel great, and it's like, yeah, this is cool. Um, and the more playbooks you write, then you start to aggregate them together, and like, well, let's create an Ansible role uh, where I can apply um, a whole category of plays on a particular machine and just have it do the right thing. So that's pretty cool, too, but the jump from playbooks to roles takes, a, takes some training and understand how it works, uh, but now you get into, you know, take it up another level and you create these modules, which are what I understand to be like a collection of roles that are distributed in, in one unit uh, through Ansible Galaxy. And so now it comes into more packaging and ease and convenience and as a trying to develop as a non-developer and manage a GitHub uh, source repository, like I'm not interested in having multiple repos trying to track various contributions on different levels from a lot of different people. And, you know, I'd like to keep it compact, uh, which kind of limits me also to, I want to keep the entire scope of the project in the understanding of one brain. And like, I'm not in a place where I can share what we're doing with 20 brains and just have us all kind of work as a community, but maybe in the future. Um, so, Kind of things you do as you learn Ansible. Um, you you start with I write a playbook. Okay, that's cool and interesting. Uh, then you create an inventory file that has all your hosts and variables in one file, and that works great until you scale beyond that single file. So then you start to break things up, and now you have you know one major file that has all the variables that usually you need to change every time you deploy the project. And then you have a bunch of smaller configs with a lot of your default parameters. Um, and then, then you start to try to do things that Ansible can't do very well because you're a programmer and you're like, you know what? I'll circumvent it. I'll use the Ansible special variables and I can fix things by doing it this way. And then you realize that Ansible is not very good at, um, at like nesting functions or basically treating plays as a reusable function. So you get creative and you use this include task capability. Um, and then you start nesting include tasks in, in one each other and it just becomes a complete mess, but kind of works because it's allowed to work, I guess. So anyway, um, at this point, the, the project really kind of ran into a technical dead end. Um, it worked great. It did exactly what it was supposed to do, but when things didn't work, it became very troublesome to debug. Uh, and then more than anything, you know, when I showed people the demo, they're like, oh, this is awesome. And then they were like, how can I extend this? Or how can I, like, I, can, I don't understand how it works. So they go to some other project. So all this was tossed out and started over with this new XSoft deploy. All right. Uh, what else was wrong? Uh, variable scoping was a, a trouble. So I'll talk about how um, Ansible works with variable scoping in just a moment. Um, but basically, because of this way I designed the project is I didn't allow Ansible to scale and manage the hosts as it would naturally do. I basically took Ansible into a single thread and ran everything on one host and then evaluated all these special variables and basically looped through things how I thought they should happen as opposed to letting Ansible do it the way it should happen. But that, now that meant all of my Ansible programming had to take care of all the variable scoping on its own. That The explanation will come in just a second. So other problems with host deployment. Um, if you can imagine you're trying to deploy a, a project at web server database whatever, typically you have to do things in some specific order for all the services to come online and work. So you might need to deploy the database first, then you have to populate the database, then you need to deploy a web server, and then you need to deploy the, the content system on top of it. Then you have to tie to do together, then you have to publish services on your load balancer. Whatever the workflow is, um, it has to be managed. And that's not exactly what Ansible's meant to do uh, when you just say, here, I've got 20 machines, go run these 50 tasks. 
it can take any order of those machines and run them at any point up until it gets to all 50. So you couldn't really predict which servers it was going to deploy first and had to manage it. So I, again, had to invent something to solve that particular problem because of the way I had designed it from the get-go. So I had this idea of this deploy plan that would basically act like the Etsy FS tab and how you mount the file systems and you have uh, a priority level or a pass number for each file system that gets mounted. So everything with a zero gets run first, everything with a one comes next. And so this system kind of worked, but again, it was ugly. It needed a pre-install, post-install, and all these hooks to make it usable. And again, very difficult to explain to somebody else how, how it works and why that was chosen to begin with. So. What's new, what's different? XTOF deploy is all Ansible with foresight into how Ansible behaves and works. And you'll see all this and understand it in just a moment. Um, it uses proper host execution as defined by Ansible and then uses Ansible tunables to correctly orchestrate the entire activity. Um, all the variables are now nested under a single uh, dictionary called XTOF deploy. And this is important when it comes to debugging because now when I debug, I just do a debug variable equals this, and I get a complete printout of all the variables associated with the deployment. Um, I, can, I also write that entire variable to a file so I can go back and see what were all the variable parameters when something failed, or if I need to reproduce that particular failure, I know what parameters I was using. Um, so this new method obviously allows Ansible to deal with the scaling and the multitasking. Um, the variable scoping is accurate. Um, and you know, I'll show you how I controlled certain things in just a moment. Um, and then the concurrency problems you deal with uh, with an Ansible, there's a variable called throttle. Um, better described through an example, but when there's a certain task, when you've got, um, let's say, 10 or 15 hosts and everybody's has a has a task that's running on the same server. You don't want everybody editing Etsy hosts at the same time. You can use a parameter called throttle. Basically, say, okay, these twenty machines are going to do the same task, but they're only going to happen one at a time. So it's a way to kind of provide um, uh, concurrency uh, resiliency, so you don't have you know file corruption or you know you get your config files all messed up. Um, then there's another parameter that you can use at the role level that basically says serialize this so that even if I tell you to go deploy this on 20 servers, you're only going to do it on two machines at a time. And so that way, uh, if you have a, a limited network, like let's say you're at home in a lab and you've only got a one gig network, you don't want 20 machines trying to use your network using NFS and all the other IO bandwidth that needs to go over that, uh, that link uh, to consume and just you know, kill everything because then you get into timeout issues and other things that start going wrong. So these are all native things to Ansible that I now use as opposed to writing that logic into my code with the old way. Okay. So let's kind of talk about what and how things work. So the XTOF deploy platform or role has a concept of the deploy host. The deploy host is where you run your playbooks. So this is where you need to have Ansible installed. This is where you unpack the project. This is where you set up your config files and where you finally run Ansible playbook with all the parameters. In the case of uh, inter interacting with um, Overt, which is Red Hat virtualization, um, the upstream project is, is Overt. Um, but basically, Overt is a a system that runs the, the uh, Overt Manager or the Rev Manager, and that host provides an API. You can designate that machine as your deployer because it already has the API libraries installed. So technically, you could just download the, the packages or the, uh, the project on your Overt uh, Manager machine and run them there. Good to go. Uh, I choose to run that externally. So basically, I deploy a virtual machine in my hypervisor environment. And I designate that, designate that box my deployer. And then in the configs, I give it the username, password, IP address, the URL of the API, along with all the other parameters it needs to deploy stuff 
into that environment. In a libvert scenario, um, and let me take a second just to kind of designate different between difference between libvert and overt. Uh, overt is kind of like VMware in its concept. You have multiple hypervisors. You have a manager, uh, similar to like a, a vCenter. Um, and the idea now is I, I can basically scale out my environment like an enterprise and have a very large virtual cluster so that as I deploy virtual machines, they could land on any one of the hypervisors. Libvert uh, is more single node, um, basically using native KVM with the libvert libraries. So you have a, a libvert library, and then you, you typically would use tools like Versh and vert install. So the libvert tools are very command line focus. The overt tools are very API focus. So deploy host name given to the machine where your playbooks run. Um, this is where also the that host will serve kickstart configs, ISOs, yum repos. So the deployer will be configured with a, a handful of services so that I can basically bootstrap a machine and install product and then also give it a, a, a repo to connect to afterwards. If you choose not to use the repo services or anything like that from the deploy host, all those variables are configurable so that if you have a satellite repo server or something else you want it to register to, you can go someplace else. Um, so let's see. So on the libvert scenario, we're talking about deploying everything as a VM on the same machine. The machine is also the deploy host. It's basically an all-in-one solution. So if you were to pick one of my workshops and you want to run it on your laptop and you've got libvert installed, then when you deploy it, it'll create a, a separate private network just for that cluster. And that way you don't have to mess with your default network. You don't have to mess with DNS mask or any of your DHCP or Pixie boot settings, and all that stuff. So it's all separate, integrated private network, easy peasy. Um, you can also convert, um, configured libvert to use a bridged network. So if you more want to leverage resources outside of your laptop, but in your lab, because you have a DNS server, a Pixie server, and all these things already configured, then you would use it in a bridged capacity. So we'll talk about that too. Um, over traditionally, all you do is basically tell it, you know, because you've already defined all your networking and stuff in that environment. So you just tell it, here's the label for the network I want you to connect my VM to. And here's the storage domain that you're going to connect to. So, okay, so OpenShift deployment on a single libvert node. OpenShift up until version, I think it was about 4.5, required uh, five dedicated machines, or let's say four dedicated machines to run the cluster, so three masters and at least one worker node. And then you typically would have a, a well, you'd have to have a bootstrap node to boot your cluster. And then typically you also deploy a, a utility server called the Bastion to basically manage all the services related to your cluster. Um, so that's six to seven machines to deploy. And then once it's all running, you basically you can delete the, the bootstrap and you have a running cluster. As of 4.6, we now support a three-node cluster model. So basically that means you take your three masters, but you also label them as workers. So you know if your memory or disk space constrained, probably not a great idea. But if you have enough horsepower in the node one, node two, node threes, um, you can deploy everything in three masters. Still need a bootstrap for the time being. So the bootstrap node is there as a temporary. Uh, and then the bastion node, um, we'll talk about in, in more detail in just a second is what basically controls the deployment and then all the uh, infrastructure resources around the cluster, things like DNS and um, you know DHCP, Pixie, those, those services you need to deploy. OK. Um, OCS deployment, private NAT network. This is basically what it looks like. So again, uh, everything's in the one gray box, which means it's all on a single host. And I deploy all these VMs as separate virtual machines. 
Um, on the deploy host, I would also deploy an HA proxy so that uh, ingress from the outside world, you know, if I'm going to connect to my OpenShift cluster, you connect to the HA proxy that runs on the physical box, not on the Bastion machine. And then the machines would have their ingress, basically, their, or their, out, their outward communications uh, through the NATed libvirt network that's separate from default. If you go with a bridge model, then basically all the nodes are in the same network as your physical machine. Um, and then the Bastion server can basically act as the HA proxy. So uh, this is probably the, the, the best lab experience because you know if people outside of your single machine wanna connect to your cluster, then setting up the bridge mode is the easiest and the best way to do it. Um, if you're learning and testing, NAT network is the easiest way to go because it's pretty much unpack the configs, minor tweak, deploy, and you're ready. Um, and then finally, this this other concept here, where you know, as a utility server only, this just basically does indicates that the OpenShift workshop playbooks stand on their own without XTOF deploy to deploy it into VMs, and so now you can have your own deployed virtual machines and then you just monkey with the config file to say, this machine is my bastion node, here's my bootstrap, here's all these others. And then the uh, the playbooks will configure the bastion server to provide all the services. And then you can just by hand go, you know, pixie boot your VMs or your bare metal machines and your cluster will be built. Okay. Um, enough about OpenShift. I think we'll probably come back to this. I think it's more entertaining if we jump right into the uh, the demo and then we can continue to talk here. Um, so again, there's two projects at work here. There's the OpenShift 4 workshop. Again, this is, it, it can deploy OpenShift. Uh, it doesn't mean it has to be in a workshop because you can use these, these playbooks to deploy OpenShift for a lot of different environments. Um, and I just happened to provide another set of um, roles this XTOF to deploy to make life easy to deploy into libvirt and or overt. Uh, VMware, Amazon, Google Cloud, like these, these are all other things that I certainly would want to get to, just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, OpenShift Workshop can stand on its own. And then uh, you can also like, if, if you find this interesting and you're like, I would never use OpenShift, but man, those deployment roles are pretty cool. You can obviously take them, integrate them into your workshop or whatever tools, and then just use the deployment aspects of this, of this uh, software. Okay, so what do you need to get started? Uh, last time I did a, a real functionality testing from the ground up, I think I used uh, 7.7 um, and 8.2. Um, so basically, if you give me a machine that's got a base install of RHEL 7 or 8, and I'll extend it to CentOS or what have you, it should work. Uh, I just don't test or you know design everything, anything with CentOS. Um, so, and then you drop um, your RHEL 8.2, probably 8.3 will work fine, but if you drop those in the home ISO directory, and then you basically do a get clone, get the project, you edit the configs, and then you run the installer, and then you sit back and watch. So basic steps. This is if everything works right. This is what it looks like. You clone the repo, you create, modify the config files. You basically decide which mode you want to use, and uh, there are sample configs for each one of these. And then once you make adjustments to the configs, you run the deployer. So that's a lot of talking, a lot of slides. Anybody have any questions so far? And feel free to interrupt me at any time. All right, so what I'm gonna do first, um, let's, I'm gonna make the font just a tiny bit bigger. So let's go down 160 and 140. That looks pretty good. Okay, so let's kind of talk about what's it look like to clone the project. So I'm gonna do get clone, provide the URL. Okay, 
Yes. Type correctly, OLCP4, dash dash reports dash sub modules. So again, uh, get the sub modules by providing this parameter. Um, we'll go out and fetch the additional source code components for those modules from the specified URL. But what's, what's interesting about submodules is, is that they're tracked with my source code. So if I make an update to the OCP4 workshop and I move the, um, the roles to the latest version, then when you pull it down, you get that locked in version. But I, I'm allowed to keep developing and moving the, um, the, the main branch forward and developing, but you'll be locked here until I go update the source for the OpenShift workshop to basically move that that branch to the next level. So uh, you got a typo, uh, you misspelled the git. So that's what it looks like. Uh, let's just take a peek inside here. I've already got a directory kind of set up so that um, we don't have to spend too much time editing and doing VI and stuff. So I'm going to move into this directory. And you'll see that there is a, a directory called sample configs. And then there's a directory here called config. So in my git ignore, I've specified that the config directory is ignored. So this allows you to copy configs into the config directory make adjustments, change parameters. And if you fork and create a, a merge that you want to push back upstream, it'll never include your config data so that if by chance you go against my recommendations and you decide to put a clear text password in the config file, um, bad on you, but it's not going to wind up in the, in the, uh, in the Git repo. Um, same is true for a couple of other directories, you know, so that there's there's work areas that don't impact source code development. And we'll talk about the configs in just a second. So the OpenShift playbooks, the OpenShift workshop playbooks are here in the OpenShift directory. And what you'll notice is that everything here is really all about the Bastion server. So there's playbooks for just installing some basic yum packages and configuring cockpit, configuring DHCP and DNS and HA proxy. And basically every one of those plays is like a, a unit of things that have to get done in order to deploy OpenShift. These files here, these deployers, these are kind of the pre and post install glue that helps me manage the deployment process. Because when I tell the deployer to go boot the master nodes, the, the deployer basically just wipes its hands and says, okay, you're gonna go pixie boot and do your own thing. But then one of these post install scripts will basically start monitoring and watching for an SSH port to become active on the, uh, on the masters. And then it'll wait for a config service to become active on the masters. And once the config service is online, then it knows I can go deploy the next phase and then it watches kind of similar activity on the next phase of machine. So it's all very metered and progressive in the way it works. Um, so those are the, the main playbooks. And then you have a roles directory where the XDOF deploy roles are. And in here you get you know, a, a, an Ansible uh, directory topology that is required for, for roles. So you go into the tasks. And there are the tasks for deployments into Overt and Libert. And there's an enormous amount of duplication. And eventually, it'd probably be nice to not have so much duplication, just even continue to merge those down. But right now, there's a clean separation between the two types of deployments um, that allows me to kind of fix one without breaking the other. Eventually, they'll find their duality and, and merge together. And then, uh, of course, there's additional templates and files and handlers and things that you know are associated with roles. OK. So what do you, would you do as a user of this particular thing? So you would go into the config directory. And then you would you know, copy from sample configs 
uh, and since I'm doing overt, I'm going to copy everything from the overt directory into this directory. And now you'll see that I have a master config file where I go make some changes. I have a XOF deploy config, config file where I also would go make changes. And the idea being is that the master config is the configuration file that's mostly associated with the workshop project. The XTOF config are the variables associated with connectivity and deployment of the virtual machines. We'll walk through the config settings here in just a second. So without spending any time here, I'm gonna hop over to a directory where I've got everything kind of ready to go. And a um, technique or something I do by design just to make sure that I'm in the right directories is I always put a period in kind of where this project is going to be deployed. So if I'm doing libvirt, it might say .nat or .bridge. So if you see that um, that type of directory naming, that's, that's why it's that way. So let's go into the config directory. Um, because obviously the sample configs are based on my environment, I just link to them so they don't have to edit and make adjustments in two different places when I commit my code to source. But all my passwords are stored in any Ansible encrypted file. So uh, you would basically use a command like Ansible um, vault encrypt. Have it out. But when you copy the text file out of the samples configs directory, you go make adjustments to the parameters and then you would Ansible encrypt it so that it could sit there and safely not you know, expose your clear text passwords to anybody else who works on your project. Um, so now let's take a look at the master config.yaml just so you understand kind of what types of parameters are in here. Um, I give my cluster a name. So my cluster here is gonna be called OCP4 rev. Uh, that cluster name is integrated into other variables that uh, you know impact the name of the virtual machine or the 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 file names of the um, the storage backends and things like that. So that basically to provide some uniqueness to the VMs as they get deployed, I prepend the cluster name to it. Uh, the cluster name will also have a dependency on your DNS server. So. Uh, I use example.com as my foundational uh, DNS domain. Then I add the cluster name, and then you add uh, the wildcard in front of that to basically provide access to all your applications that run into OpenShift. We can talk about that a little bit later once we kind of get this project going here. So other basic parameters, what version of OpenShift am I gonna deploy? Uh, what's the name of my cluster admin going to be? And then for the, the workshop exercises, it'll create a, a user called cloud user. Uh, that, you know, the, the general password will be created in the credentials file so that it's stored and encrypted. Um, and then I have this idea here, this creds directory where I have the same line twice, so it's clearly a typo. But um, the creds directory is where a lot of the artifacts after deploying the cluster kind of get dumped, but it's also important because that's where the OpenShift installer deposits the uh, the kube config keys and the password to basically get back into your cluster. So when OpenShift deploys, there's no password. It generates an enormous random password, and there's also an SSH key that's basically deployed ahead of time. Um, and then it's up to you to go fix it, but nothing here. Okay, um, other basic parameters. Eh, you know what, let's use less so that I can go back up and down. Okay, other basic parameters. So the Bastion server provides a DNS server. It provides DHCP, Pixie. Uh, it can create um, ISOs compatible with uh, UEFI. Um, so every one of these services, you can turn on and turn off through a variable. Um, and I also provide a NFS server on the Bastion node that acts as a persistent, kind of a cheap persistent store, uh, provided that you don't have some other type of storage you want to connect your OpenShift cluster to. 
uh, basic network information. Um, I early on adopted this nomenclature of saying G underscore for anything that's designed to be a global variable. Um, and so I have my network information here. And then as we get down closer to the hosts, now I have the information that tells Red Hat Core OS by default, what is the disk that you're going to install on by default? How are you going to configure your network? Uh, and then there's a parameter, you know, if you're deploying on HPs with ILOs that have the integrated USB storage nonsense, you better set that to a value so that your ILO storage doesn't get detected before your root disk. Um, so there you would just change that delay to 10 or 15 so that that just guarantees when Red Hat CoreOS boots up as it discovers your storage that your USB storage doesn't show up as SDA because things tend to break after that. Anyway, um, now we get into kind of the separation of actual deployment. Like I have a hardware config that defines actual hardware information. So if I'm connecting to VMware, my ethernet device might be called ETH0. If I'm using libvirt, then my hard drive might be called V with, with a Victor DA as opposed to SDA. So your device names might be different. Those are hardware profiles. Then you have the RS profile or your resource profile that says, I need two virtual CPUs. I need 16 gig of RAM. Those kinds of things are resource profiles. And then lastly, you have a kickstart profile. A kickstart profile says, use this ISO. Here's my repo. Here's the how I want you to deploy me. So the kickstart profile can specify, I'm all pixie, so don't bother configuring anything else. Somebody else is going to respond to the, the install me command. Um, if it's a network-based install, then I'm going to use the boot ISO for the version of Linux I'm going to install. And I'm going to basically pre-cook SSH keys in there, the kernel parameters for it to do its installation. I'm going to drop the ks.cfg into the ISO. And that way, when I do the provisioning, it's a nice, clean, compact ISO. Machine boots up, and then it starts its install. Um, I've elected for now to basically just support one style of kind of provisioning. And that is that custom boot ISO model where I unpack the generic stuff that comes from Red Hat. I add the kickstart kernel parameters, everything else to the ISO Linux.cfg, repack it, hand it over to vert install and say, go. Uh, because that model also works with overt. And that way I'm basically managing the same technique and the same code paths in the two different environments. Uh, in the past, in, a, in that previous uh, WS deploy uh, KVM uh, role, I also had a more libvert, cool, and fancy way of deploying things where I would boot the VM directly from the, the Red Hat generic DVD ISO. And then when that VM would shut down, I would use a lib guest FS to mount the virtual image to inject SSH keys and do a couple of other funky things. And then it would shut down and reboot the machine. The end goal is the same, but now I had two different techniques to go chase after if I needed to adjust kernel parameters and such. So anyway, with the new clean code, everything uses boot ISO and it just works for now. Um, I have, for example, here, because the, the Bastion server boots rel, I use the rel 8.2 profile with the boot ISO. Uh, everything else in the cluster boots with Pixie. And then the Pixie has a couple of parameters. There's a profile called Pixie weight, and there's another one called Pixie no weight. And Pixie no weight is exactly that. It just tells the virtual machine to Pixie, and then it's a fire and forget, and it never looks back. Uh, Pixie weight basically says, Pixie the machine, but wait to see if the, you know, the Pixie process and the initial installation then shuts down the machine and it turns off then Ansible will turn the machine back on and so that we can log back in, continue the, uh, the deployment process. So these are all the types of parameters. You know, After a year of doing this, you kind of figure out what, value, what parameters have value, which ones don't, and you kind of clean out the, um, the mess and get rid of the old stuff that was useless. So 
when you design an Ansible inventory file, and that's the config that we're looking at here, uh, let me let me go back to the top. An Ansible inventory file uh, is designed to have uh, kind of like your global variables, but then you can also scope the variables down to uh, a host group or even further than to the host itself. So we see here that I have you know all vars. These are my global variables that would apply to everybody. When I come down here to my host group vars, here I define a host group called my deploy host. And then I say, this is the vars section for that deploy, for the, any host in that deploy group. And I basically, here I just short circuit Ansible and say, this is the local machine. And that way it doesn't have to do like the SSH connectivity. You don't have to deal about, you know, setting up your SSH keys and stuff. It just, it just works. Um, when I come to my Bastion server, the Bastion, any machine in that host group will have the following variables. And then the same is true for machines that are in the bootstrap and then in the masters. And, and you'll notice there, there's a lot of overlap, right? So there's hardware profile. Everybody uses overt SDA because everything's going into overt. I could have very easily just defined H, hwprof equals overt SDA up in the all vars section and deleted those lines here. But just for consistency and ease of looking at that group, it just made it easier just to keep them all clumped together. And every time you define one, you just define all three. Um, and then when you come down to the actual hosts, this is where you define your machines. You'll see that uh, I've got a commented out here, uh, but I had a node six that's a bare metal machine and I pass along a, a different IP address or a different profile. So per machine, per host, I can override the, the variables and parameters that you see up here. So this is where kind of Anthable starts that whole concept of, um, of your variable scoping is what namespace is this variable in? Does this belong to node six? Does it belong to the, the group that host that node six is in? Is it global? And that way when the playbooks run and I'm running tasks that belong to node six, I don't have to care which HW profile variable is because it's all been scoped correctly and I get the value that I expect. In my previous uh, incantation of these Ansible playbooks, I had to go to the special variables and basically just you know one uh, dictionary after another keep traversing a very complicated tree of how do I get to the value that I want and then discover later that I actually got the value that I wanted by accident. I actually traversed that tree incorrectly. And you know, I just didn't discover that it was a bug until somebody said it doesn't work in this use case. And then after troubleshooting, he's like, well, why did I ever do it that way? It was a mess. So there's now the, the, ver the values are all nice and clean. OK, last config file. Um, this is the deployment config now. And so here the deploy config, and remember we copied this out of a, a samples directory where all the configs had already been kind of validated and stuff. But you'll see that uh, in my, this is now not, no longer uh, you know var variable equals value. This is now YAML style. So I have a, a dictionary that I create a, a, a top level a dictionary called XTOF deploy config. I turn on debug so I get a little extra messaging. Uh, I turn on another variable called cleanup so that as I do my deployments, um, I go clean up all my temp directories so that where I unpacked a DVD, for example, I go delete that before I get to the 10th machine and I run out of disk space. So the cleanup parameter basically allows me to kind of pick up my mess as I go along. Um, so here I define my platform as overt. If I was using libvert, it would say libvert. If I'm using bare metal, it would say bare metal. Um, so uh, let's see. So then the IP address here, uh, this is the IP address of my deploy host where my services will be running. So this is where I define that my, my repos, my kickstarts, all those things will be accessible. Um, and then if you just stick with the defaults, which in most cases should work for everybody, um, you say, yep, use uh, HTTP to provide those services. I want you to sit on this port. Um, Anybody here hasn't messed with a uh, cockpit or what we call the web console, um, 
it's web config from 20 years ago, but it works and it's glorious. Like it, it can do so much cool stuff. If you haven't messed with cockpit, it's worth installing and taking a look at. And uh, I can show you some of that later today too, if we still have time. Um, in any case, but like there's my temp directory. I set up where kickstarts will be, what the kickstart URL, URL will be, repos, junk like that. Uh, where the ISOs will be stored. And then here comes the actual overt information, right? So um, what are my virtual machines gonna be named? Like I said earlier, I use that cluster name as a prefix and then the host name of the machine that Ansible is currently working on. So I don't have to go find that variable. That's an Ansible variable called inventory host name. Straightforward, it always means the same thing. Anybody that programs in Ansible will know that variable. So the cluster name is my Red Hat virtualization cluster name, uh, provides a link to a CA file, um, insecure. Yeah, I'll allow it. You know, I'm in, in my home lab, it's, it's good for now. If you're a terrible person, you will put your username and password in this file. It will work. But generally speaking, you leave this empty. And I have a comment here that those parameters belong in the vaulted credentials file, not here. Um, OK, and then just more networking parameters. And these parameters here, we defined in the master config. So technically, unless there's some reason why you need to contort this or change the parameters, you just leave these alone. They just glue together. Uh, and then which storage pool do you want the uh, the VMs to get into? All right, I think we're ready to kick this off. Anybody that's never seen Red Hat virtualization before, this is Red Hat virtualization. This is the, upst well, the upstream project for Red Hat virtualization is overt. So there is, as in everything that's in Red Hat's portfolio has an upstream counterpart, Overt is available for um, for free lab development, what have you. Um, but this is what it looks like. So let's start with, I have two machines that are in the rack here to my right. Uh, they are both up. Uh, these are Intel 8 core, 128 gigs a piece, just to give you some idea of, of what the um, configs look like. Um, also, in general, here's a, a quick diagram of what my home lab looks like. So uh, the, the, I've got these two machines down here. Uh, and then I've got a 10 gig Mikrotik 8 port switch, which is pretty common. If anybody doesn't have one for your home lab, you know, if you get them on sale, they're probably like 299, 300 bucks, but they're 350 regular. Uh, you can also get a four port, just depends on, uh, I think four ports like a uh, hundred and change now. It's, it's silly cheap to get 10 gig networking into your home. Um, and they're also fanless, so they just have a heat sink and they're, they're you know, completely quiet. Um, in any case, so my storage network between my two RevH machines is um, 10 gig, and then everything else is just one gig networks, but I have three separated networks for data management and storage in my Rev environment. My Rev manager runs as a VM on an Intel Nook that sits in the top of my cabinet. All right. So this is the virtualization manager. Uh, so those are my two hosts. I'm gonna come over to my list of virtual machines and you'll basically see that, okay, I got a handful of virtual machines, nothing that exciting. So I've already done all the exercise of configuring my um, big files. So now all that's left to do is for me to actually run the deployment scripts. One last thing I wanna talk about before I do that. This is the glue. So if you create your own project that, that implements the roles to deploy, you wind up owning, I got to go create this glue script that basically unites the, that master config inventory with an, an order of execution. So here you see a play that says host, my deploy host. So these are tasks that are going to happen on your deploy host and it's going to run the setup role and then if the setup if you've designated your machine your platform as overt or libvert it'll run the roles associated to that setup so the setup will 
install the right kernel modules. It'll configure nested virtualization. It'll install all the libvirt tools. Like it'll, it'll take that base install of RHEL and install everything else that you need to get the virtualization pieces going, including installing cockpit, because with cockpit, you can also control all your VMs. Uh, Vert manager is great, but if you don't have a GUI, it's useless. So installing cockpit gives you a, a web console based way of, of managing your virtual machines uh, with libvirt. It's and it, every time we release it, there's new updates and it's really getting exceptional with uh, the capabilities that you can have with it, including accessing the console, right? So getting to the console, whether it's a text console or a graphics console through an HTML5 browser, it's, it's awesome. OK, so first task, run the setup. And you'll see here, like, well, there's a command called setup, or there's another command called setup plus. If you run setup plus, then it runs the setup, and then it also tries to do the deployment right away. So it basically merges two commands into one. Uh, and for a few of the my colleagues who are on the phone who have used my tools in the past, setup plus is new, so you'll just need to do a, a get pull to get the new stuff. Um, anyway, so then we have the undeploy action. So if you know if I run my playbooks with undeploy, then basically it'll log into Overt and go delete all the virtual machines, so that it just cleans up after itself. Well, there is another option called redeploy that basically says, well, if I've got the cluster deployed, delete it, but then immediately reinstall it. And then the final glue down here is the actual deploy. So there's a, the, the pre-process here takes care of a, a particular step. And that has to do with, because the fact my Bastion node. So this is the node that provides. All right. Live streaming is on. We're back. Oh, I think he must have turned it back on. All right, we're good. Yeah, well, he said that the, it only lasts for an hour, so he has to re restart it. That's actually a good timing to let me know that I need to get this thing running. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. Um, OK, so here we are uh, with the pre-process. And so what I was talking about was there's a couple of things. Because the Bastion needs to configure DHCP, Pixie, and, and all the other services to, to get my, um, my cluster up, I need to have MAC addresses ahead of time. Um, and if you're deploying into a virtual machine, and you can generate a random Mac, that's cool because now you don't have to add it to the file. If I'm you know, configuring a, a bare metal machine, then in that master config file, I need to you know, say my, or that P underscore pub Mac equals, I give it the Mac address. But if I don't give it a Mac address, it sure would be cool if my role would just generate one for you. Well, it can, and it does. It just has to do it during the pre-process phase. It can't do it during the real-time phase, because then it's too late for me to create those config files that belong in the Bastion. So that's what pre-process is primarily for. In the future, it might do more. Um, and the comments, let me point out, right? So I, I did take a lot of time to rewrite everything. But at the same time, I'm also trying to comment the code so that I can also tell myself why I did things this way, because I want it to make sense. And then it also helps me when somebody asks me, why did you do it this way? Go read my comments. OK. Um, then finally, it comes down to the actual deployment. And then at the end, so the, these are the, the roles, right? So this is a role to run the deployment stuff. So now this would create virtual machines. Well, when a group of virtual machines associated with this host group are built, there might be some stuff I need to do in between that's not related to the role. So in this case here, I've got some tasks that need to happen on the Bastion host to install software, configure TFTP, configure the DHCP server, set up what have you. You know Everything that we've turned on that said flagged yes, like these are all software services that need to be configured on, the, on that virtual machine. Once that virtual machine is ready, well, now I've got another set of tasks that I can begin with. So, I, I run these tasks, and then I have this checkpoint here that says, well, in that playbooks directory, there's a deploy or pre-install that basically says, go check to see if SSH is available. Go make sure that the DHCP server is available. Like It just tests a bunch of ports to make sure that the Bastion server is good to go. And then it starts the next role, which is 
go deploy my bootstrap node. And then when the bootstrap node runs, when this finishes off, now this is a pixie boot. And remember that that, that, that uh, kickstart definition for this machine was uh, pixie weight. So that meant that this machine's gonna pixie and it's gonna install Red Hat Core OS. At the end of the installation, it's gonna shut down the, uh, the, the VM. Um, I take it back. In Overt, it doesn't shut down the VM, but it does reboot it. So the VM will reboot. And then when it comes back online, I basically have here another play that says, wait for the config service to turn on. So the, the core OS machine will come back and it'll start to configure itself and start to get itself ready. And then once it's ready to provision the master servers, it turns up this config service and that's my signal, go deploy the masters. So here we have my masters and away goes the deployment. And then basically comes down and the same thing happens down here. So I have a, a pre-install for the worker nodes. It just watches the masters. And once the config service is available on the masters, I go deploy my workers. And at the very end, once my workers are all deployed, then I have this finish script that basically does kind of those, uh, those day two operational things that once the cluster's out there and it's deployed and working, you got to take care of some certificate management. You need to kind of wait for your operators to all become online. And, and these are this is very OpenShift Kubernetes terminology, has nothing to do with the playbooks themselves, but just watching the cluster to wait for the functionality to all be there. And then something I added just recently was an additional play that says, well, my cluster's up, everything's healthy, go to delete that bootstrap machine because I don't need it anymore, in fact, I, I can never use the bootstrap machine to do anything because it's essentially deactivated itself once the cluster has been deployed. Okay. So back to Red Hat virtualization view. Here's my shell. Whoops. Very clicky Windows putty. All right. Xsoft deploy. Deploy. It prompts me for my vault password. And then it starts the deployment process. So the way Ansible works, right? You give it a list of hosts in a in a host group, and then it runs tasks associated with that host group. So you know, in the beginning, when I showed you that config file just a second ago, the first thing it does, and I'm skidding, I'm skipping over the setup. I don't need to run setup plus because this machine's already been provisioned and, and ready for overt support. So I'm just running the deploy piece. So it skips over any tasks unrelated to overt or the actual deployment aspects of, of an overt. So that's why you see a lot of skipping stuff because the way Ansible works is you've got a, a library of things to do on a machine. If that task isn't associated with what you're trying to do, then it just skips right over it. So what's happening now, this is the configuration phase of it. So it's basically, it's got all the data that's in the master config.yaml. Um, and what it's going to do now is it's uh, creating a, a custom ISO to provision the Bastion server. So there we see the upload ISO image. And all these things that interact with Overt is over the API using an Overt module for Ansible. So just like you would use the yum module to install a package, I use the Overt module to say, upload an ISO image to this storage domain. So if I jump over here into my storage view and I go to disks, we should see that there's a disk called OSP4 Bastion right here. That is my root disk. So that would be the, the same as like my VMDK or my QCOW image for a, a virtual machine. But then I've also dropped this ISO image into the same storage domain and I'm gonna boot the machine from that image. And then when the, the install is complete, the cleanup flag will basically trigger my playbooks to go delete that ISO, because otherwise it would kind of leave these remnants behind. So if you're trying to debug a problem and you want those remnants, then you can say clean up no. And then not only would you have the ISO files here, you would have also all the working directories and temp space files that kind of produced that image so that you could get right to what was the ISO Linux config file, like for example. Anyway, so let's go back to compute virtual machines. And now that we've seen that it finished the upload, 
It uh, then basically creates the virtual machine. It adds the boot disk. It uh, so Some of my virtual machines might want more disks than just the boot disk. So if the, um, the resource requirements declare extra disks, then it just iterates through a list of extra disks that you say, I need a 10 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig disk. It would basically add those to the VM. Uh, then it attaches the VM as the CD-ROM, changes the boot device to, um, to network. Now that's actually kind of a little bit misleading because uh, it still prioritizes it. So it, it's actually gonna boot from CD, but it's still there. And I could probably just go fix that that output string there. Um, in any case, and then the last thing it does is it changes the state of the VM to running. So at this point, we can click on the machine, open the console, and it should be in the middle of the, uh, the kickstart, yeah. So it's already halfway through the kickstart here. So again, what got deployed is the the boot ISO, not the DVD. So the the Rel eight DVD is like eight gigs. The boot ISO is like six or seven hundred um, six or seven hundred gigs. And um, at first, I was using the DVD, and it works great. But you're you're left waiting for this upload time to you know upload the DVD to the storage domain for a good three minutes or something like that over my one gig link. Uh, actually, it's maybe just a minute or so. But in any case, it's way more than just a few seconds. With By using the boot ISO, that's not a complete RHEL installation. It's just the boot up and enough stuff to kind of kick off a kickstart. So I use the boot start, provide it with the right information for where the resource, the kickstart files, and all that information is. And then I use that to boot the VM. And that's what's going on here. All right, we'll let that run for a second and go talk about some other stuff. Let me switch consoles here. All right. Okay, kind of want to wait for, nah, let's go ahead and just look at this one more time. Okay, so I, I mentioned this idea of throttling before. Um, and so, you know, anybody who's worked in Unix with multitasking, right? If, if everybody edits or all your processes edit the same file at the same time, unless you implement proper file locking, uh, chances are you're gonna get some file corruption, right? So if I edit a file, Gordon edits the file, John edits the file, and we all hit enter to our changes at the same time, whoever wins, kind of your edits get saved, but everybody else's kind of gets lost or, or whatever. Uh, it's a problem. So if you extend that into, well, I'm deploying a, a cluster of virtual machines, everybody's editing the same config file on the Bastion host, uh, that could present a problem. I don't know if if Ansible handles that uh, when I, I delegate that task to a single machine. So I choose to throttle, and I choose to use this uh, this other parameter. Um, where is it here? The serial parameter to basically limit how many tasks are running at the same time. Uh, again. You know, if uh, if I've got limit limited network capacity, sure I can build and deploy ten machines at the same time. But over a one gig network, I'm probably going to run into network timeouts or some other drop packets issues, so that I'm going to have a lot of retransmission problems. And now, not only is my deployment going to go a lot slower, it's really going to crater due to these other problems. So in my config files here, so this is that glue file that I talked about that that uh, XTOF config underscore uh, dot YAML. And so this is where you define host group, do your activities, right? The, the Bastion server is always just one machine at a time. It's just one machine. You would never really have two Bastion machines because then it wouldn't be a Bastion, it'd be something else. Um, but where I would deploy two machines or perhaps more at a time uh, when it comes to a deployment, I may want to specify serial. But with the masters, it's always three machines at a time. 
Uh, in the case of workers, right now I'm only doing two machines. But if I had to, if I was going to deploy a full cluster, I might just want to add that that serial line here that says just do three at a time or four at a time, whatever it is. Um, so let Ansible do what Ansible is supposed to do. Don't write code if you don't have to. Um, let's take a look at a couple of playbooks after we see what we're doing here. OK, so my console is gone. Uh, let's change screens back. And we see that we're already underway with the deployment. So uh, before, let me back up a couple of pages here. We'll go max. Uh, I'm going to go back up a couple of pages here. So here we had uh, the, the, the informative string, basically. I've, this is the nomenclature I've, I've come up with. It says, hey, this is XTOF deploy. I'm running on the libvirt deploy monitor. So this is a uh, the section where it's just watching what's happening with the VM before it moves on. Um, but once it de de detects that the VM is back up or it needs to, it's down, needs to be started off, whatever needs to happen, then we move on to the next part. Or now we're transitioning to the actual workshop or the bastion setup. So now we're in the OCP4 workshop plays. So these are all the files that are in the uh, playbooks directory. Um, and now I'm running the, the this script here, the deployer configuration. So this is now just watching to see what's going on with, um, um, it's gonna capture the, in this case, it's gonna go grab the, uh, the pull secret. This is a file that relates to the installation of OpenShift. So it's just trying to find that config file. Um, if it doesn't find it, then Ansible fails. Scroll down a little bit more. Um, the scripts also take care of deleting SSH keys, because every time you deploy your cluster, you're probably going to have new SSH keys. So in this case, on the deploy host and on the bastion, it has uh, Ansible plays to go delete all the old SSH keys, automatically scan the new ones, so that when you run Ansible, it doesn't say, do you want to accept this SSH key? Oh, your host name is Choi. You're changed. Go fix that before you continue that kind of junk. The playbooks take care of all that. Okay, and then as we go down here, now we're actually into the installation of the stuff. So you know, it's basically installing cockpit. It's going to set up the DNS servers, and it's just going to iterate through each one of those plays. So let's get back to the bottom. Jump out of this. Switch consoles. Let's go take care. Let's go take a look at some of the um, actual tasks that uh, the the roles for. Um, so, like I said, um, tasks between overt and libvert are very similar. Um, probably the most interesting thing to look up will be the actual deployment itself. And this is just over the course of a, a, you know 12 months worth of practice where you find the similarities and you kind of have a path where it all works the same. Uh, again, spend a lot of time documenting and trying to get rid of redundancy or variables that were once used and then you forget. I don't know if that means anything anymore, but you leave it sitting in your code. That should all be cleaned up at this point. Um, but this is basically what a deployment looks like uh, as a playbook using the uh, overt module, the API module. So you, you log out, you log into overt. And at this point, when Ansible is executing this, remember, it's, it's, it's executing this for every host that's in my current host group. So if my host group is my masters and I have five masters, it could potentially be running this five times at the same time. And the way Ansible works, right, it's one task at a time, and it keeps all the machines that it's working on basically in lockstep. So everybody runs login to overt. Um, maybe that's good. Maybe it's not good. So in this case, I throttle it to one, because the last thing I want the overt API to do is say, hey, I'm being attacked. Uh, let me shut off the API for, for uh, you know 10 seconds or so. We'll, you know, let this storm settle down. So. By setting the throttle to one, whatever the first machine is that executes this task, he's the one that logs in. And now I assume because this particular uh, module has a state parameter, 
that the second machine that tries to log in, when it looks at the state of the, um, the authentication credential, it'll say, I'm already logged in. I can skip this task. Don't worry about it. So good to go. So by throttling it, I think I'm limiting it. Is it, do I know that for a fact? Not yet. I'll go sort this out with an Ansible expert when the time comes. Um, so then the first thing the deployer does, determine the state of the VM. Um, if the virtual machine, and this is my, my thinking of how these plays work, if the virtual machine is up and running, then the assumption is you ran the deployment, something failed, you want to fix whatever failed and just rerun the deployment without tearing everything down and bringing everything back up. So if you got past this point, which is the longest part of setting up the deployer, uh, I'm sorry, setting up the bastion, if you get to this point and you're 10 minutes in and you realize like, oh no, I got the MAC address wrong or my network was wrong or some other parameter was wrong, you don't have to go back and redeploy the bastion host. You can just tell it to rebuild the config files but at least it doesn't have to go download and provision and do the kickstart and all the other stuff. So my thinking is when I detect the state of the VM, if the VM is running, the assumption is whatever task happened on that VM succeeded. So don't run you know, a deploy. Don't go try to redeploy something that's already been deployed. If the machine is down, then I assume, okay, I don't need to go recreate all the resources but I am going to reprovision the disk. I'm going to reprovision the machine as if it was a net new build. So machine up, leave it alone. Machine is down or missing. We provision it from scratch. All right, so that's why we determine the state of the VM. And that's basically now the results of what you do. And now we, now we come to the first kind of anthropolism that most uh, beginners aren't familiar with. It's this concept of delegate to a machine. So Ansible's normal behavior when you run a play is to connect to that remote machine. So if I want to run something on worker two, Ansible wants to connect to worker two and then run tasks on worker two, like yum install software, go configure these files, turn on the service, edit your firewall ports. But the execution happens on the machine. Well, for the first part of this whole process, these machines don't exist. I'm provisioning the Bastion server, but I need the config information from all my other nodes that are in the cluster. So by using this delegate to host, I basically say, when you run these tasks as worker one, run them on the, uh, on the, on the Bastion node. So, or in this case, on the local host. So that's what delegate to, buys you. It, it allows you to basically access the namespaced variables for that inventory host in simple Ansible programming or, or uh, Ansible, uh, yeah, whatever the term is. But everything's normal and Ansibleized, and therefore the variables are easy to interpret, easy to understand. When you debug, it all makes sense. OK, that's what Delegate2 does. So, I'm delegating to my local host. I want to go clean up all my temp workspace. I want to create a new workspace. Um, and then I have this block. So with every task, you can associate uh, uh, parameters like when, when this and that or this. You can associate a, a loop so that I want to, you know, I have a bunch of different values or I have a list of values. Um, when you create a block, you can kind of wrap a, a, a set of tasks and then provide those um, the contingencies or the or the lists of things you want to loop around to everything that's within that block. So this is a block. It, it's almost like a a submodule or a function or whatever you want to call it. But it basically just groups a bunch of tasks together, and then at the bottom I'll have a, a condition that says only do this if that. So these are all tasks associated with setting up a kickstart. I only need to do this task if my machine that I'm deploying needs the kickstart repo. If it doesn't need it, skip over it. And I have a, another block that basically says, well, if you need an ISO or if you need, uh, let's see here, what are the other parameters that I look for here? Um, 
if I'm building an ISO, I need to adjust the kickstart, the ISO Linux config parameters, et cetera. Um, adding kernel arguments. It's all pretty well documented. We don't need to spend too much time looking at this. And let's get down to the bottom, the actual, how do I create a virtual machine? So remember at the top of this file, I already called the uh, overt login function. So I'm logged in. I've already statted the, the existence of the virtual machine. So I know if it's running or not. Um, so in this case, um, I'm now going to create a new VM. And so I provided the parameters that came out of my resource definitions, uh, which have now been integrated into a single dictionary. That's something I, I didn't show earlier, but I, I'll come back to it here in just a minute. Um, but basically, I provide parameters. I provide network information, what type of graphical console, what operating system it's going to use. And this is part of the, uh, the Kickstart profile where I basically tell it that you're a rel eight variant kind of thing. Um, and then it decides like, do I deploy? So I, uh, somewhere in there should be a state parameter that says stopped. So it's gonna create the virtual machine. It's gonna leave it in the stop state and it's gonna wait until all those resources are assigned. Then it moves on to, well, let's add a boot disk. So now we add a disk. And then here we have a segment where I'm going to loop through the resource definition for any extra storage definitions. And for every one of those, I'm gonna create another disk and attach it to that VM. And then finally on the bottom here, we're gonna actually boot the machine. So now I attach the ISO to the virtual machine. Uh, I change the, uh, the boot device to the network. Again, this just sets the priority and for a non-Pixie boot, it's, I could probably leave this out. I just needed, it's not, this is one of those things I got left here when I did it the first time and it worked, never revisited if it was actually necessary. Uh, but then lastly, the last thing here is turn the state of my virtual machine to running. Here's all the parameters. So this auth, this is the token that was generated when I log in. So this is just a variable that I use with all my overt calls. And so that contacts the API, changes that machine to running. And then am I going to wait for anything? Nope. Once it's up, move on. And if, uh, if my throttle or my serial is set to a high enough number, then it's going to move on to that next machine. So if my throttle set to five, I could potentially have five virtual machines all building at the same time. Okay, so then let's go to the bottom here. Uh, last thing I do, log out. Okay, let's go check in and see how our cluster's building. Okay, so the bootstrap machine built, and the bootstrap serves the one purpose of basically starting up a, a miniature OpenShift uh, etcd. So it basically looks like an OpenShift cluster so that you can build an OpenShift cluster. It's kind of like the same concept with uh, OpenStack where you have a director, you have kind of the over cloud, under cloud, and one manages the other. So the Bastion's just OpenShift services that fake out the real cluster until it's been built. So this service came online, my monitor script waited until um, the config service was turned on, then it deployed the masters, and now it's in the process of deploying the worker nodes. So if we come down here and do a switch back to a terminal, we should see that now we're waiting uh, for availability on the masters to deploy. So there's my bootstrap, node one, and then my three masters. And once the master services here are on, then it's gonna boot the workers and then just wait for the cluster to build. How are we on time? So we are now at 8.30. It's almost like brew time. So I'm just gonna let the demo run. Um, I don't have any further slides to go through other than thank you slide with links. Hey, Christoph, uh, you mentioned earlier you might go through uh, a little more detail about Cockpit. Hmm. Um, where do I have Cockpit running? Let's go see. Uh, is it there? It is. OK. so. Cockpit, it's a, a package you install. So you do like a yum install cockpit by default. I think it, if you just do a regular rel install, it's going to be there. Uh, but then you, you know, system CTL enable cockpit. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, once you get there, this is what your screen will look like. Let's uh, a little bit bigger. Uh, I'm just going to log in as root, and hopefully I don't put my password out in clear text or on my camera. We're good here. Um, if you're if you're a regular user and you're configured with sudo, you can log in as your regular user. Uh, you can also checkbox the, the as you log in. There's a checkbox that says "Use my password for uh, like escalation stuff." So that if you if you're defined as wheel or you have sudo, uh, then you, you can do all rootly types of things. Um, so here's my local host, and if you install uh, cockpit machines. Uh, all these are modules. You'll get this uh, module here where you can see your VMs that are running. And you can click on the VM. You can come to the console. Uh, that machine is not on, so that's not a fair example. So we can come to the console. And they're here. My, my, this is my machine here, Valar and Iluvatar are very uh, Middle Earth named. So this is all like Silmarillion type stuff. But in any case, uh, this is my like my... DNS server and stuff. So this is like my infrastructure machine. Um, but if it was a graphical console, I could access the graphical console from here. Um, let's see. Nah, I better not go to that one yet. That's my lab in the colo. I don't want to put my IP address out there before the place has been fully secured yet. <laughs> but yeah, so this is what, uh, what Cockpit looks like. Uh, it provides a terminal. So I can get on the, you know, get on the terminal and do stuff from here. Uh, there's basic, you know, there's pretty decent cut and paste in and out of, the, out of this HTML5 based console, right? This has always been kind of the bane of I want to remote into a machine. If you just turn on cockpit, you get pretty good functionality without having to set up any other services. It's all over SSL, it's encrypted. You know, it's a very easy way to allow somebody, like if you have a lab at home and you're like, hey, I need to log into a machine or you're trying to get some help from somebody, instead of going through all the effort of setting up a VPN or setting up a, you know, an SSH port to pass through or what have you, just pass through port 9090, set up an account for them. They can log in, get stuff, do things. And if you're both logged in the cockpit, you can watch the same terminal and you're basically sharing the same screen. It's kind of cool. Um, so from cockpit, you can manage, you know, if you're Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you can manage your, your subscriptions from here. Uh, that machine's probably not connected and unregistered right now because my employee subscription just lapsed a, a week ago, mid-January. And uh, if I've renewed it, I just haven't gone around on my machines to fix it. Um, you can configure like kernel dump stuff. Uh, so if you want to turn on kernel dumps and configure a couple of parameters, you can do that here. Um, if you, uh, let's see, if we go to the dashboard. So, well, the dashboard gives you general information. Here, you can also add multiple hosts. So you can see that I've got two machines configured here. Uh, my other machine's just not available right now. But if my other machine was turned on here, this test AMD box, I could connect to it through this master console. So I wouldn't have to go to another browser to con connect to cockpit and everything else. I could connect right to that machine and configure everything there as if, it, as if I was local here, which is pretty neat. Um, and then you can, as you have more hosts, all these graphs will show you kind of, you know, all your performance, network, memory, IO, disk IO, it collects all that information. If you want to make that, that data persistent, uh, you can come over here to the system. Uh, there's a button here called store metrics. If I turn that on and I have root privileges, then it'll basically install uh, PCP components to collect and store metrics over time. Because normally, it only starts collecting metrics for these graphs after you log in. If I log out, it discards all the information. If you flip store metrics on, then it's persistent and it collects that constantly, which is pretty cool. Um, in the, let's just go ahead and jump here. Uh, not get hug. So again, I, th this link is at the uh, the tail end. This is the Rel8 hands-on workshop that uh, I make for Summit every year. Uh, and one of the things that I do miss, you know, not being local to Blue anymore, is that you know March always provided me a nice opportunity to 
kind of flush out the presentations that I make for Summit. And if you go back and look through history where I was presented in March, there's pretty much a one-to-one -one for what I'm presenting at Summit, I'll present in March to give it a first run to figure out where things aren't working so much. So oftentimes it gave you uh, as a group uh, a preview for you know some Red Hat Summit content. Um, and it also provided me a, a wonderful audience to, to practice things with. Um, but in any case, the Rel8 Hands-On Lab is here. If you want to just read through the docs, um, you can just click through the online documentation and, and read the web console. Why, hello. I've got a big giant dog next to me. How are you doing, Kirby? Um, great unit that steps through web console, configuring it, turning it on, how you use it, what to do with it, that kind of stuff. Hey, you leave my coffee cup alone. Now. Come here. Negative, sir. Sorry, right. got a dog digging through my trash. My daughter's home with uh, her big puppy, so he wants the leftover Starbucks coffee cup with chocolate syrup on the bottom. <laughs> you, you mentioned March, Christoph. We don't have anyone uh, speaking in March, so uh, if you have a topic, uh, talk you want to do in March, uh, that's still open. Well, easy things are always things that I have workshops that are pre-built for, or you know, topics that we talk about for Summit. So, if if we want to talk about Relate. I can provide whatever the latest Rel8 update is, and we can talk about the workshop and go through those things. Um, we, could, we could potentially try and do hands-on workshop uh, where I could provision you know, cloud environments for everybody to fiddle with, and that way we can actually do the workshop. Um, I just need to see ah, dogs back in the trash. All right, give me one second. I'm going to go move the trash to the real trash. I'll be right back. Okay. Sure, he wants to laugh at my uh, uh, He's 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 calling her free. Well, yeah. All right. But now you got the lid. Come He's here, buddy. All day. He's just kind of got something. All right. All right. We're back in action. Okay. Let's go check on the cluster while we had that break there. So, Bastion's deployed. My bootstrap's deployed. Masters are all deployed. It's working on the worker nodes. You can see that those nodes are currently rebooting. So we're actually pretty close to having a cluster deployed and ready to go. Um, things that impact the time it takes to deploy a cluster uh, you know, obviously local network speeds and stuff like that. But when you deploy OpenShift, what you have locally set up for the deployment is a handful of files. You have a copy of Red Hat Core OS. You have uh, an install image. You have a few other things that basically kick off the process and install Red Hat Core OS. OpenShift itself is all, um, you know, containerized operators and things that it pulls down from another service called Quay. So we basically go to our online public registry to go pull down the components to deploy a cluster. So if you have a slow network, that process can take a, a quite a bit of time. Um, it may even exceed some of my timeout parameters where I'm watching and monitoring the cluster deployment. So something that I really haven't taken into consideration, which I ran into uh, last week, is you know if somebody's got an older DSL line or something like that, it just it his deployment worked, but he just had to run the deploy a couple of times to basically just keep moving, advancing the the monitoring further, so that it could pick up when certain components were finished deploying. It all still worked. Just timeout values need to be adjusted in the future. So let's come here and take a quote. Oh, let's go back to this guy. All right, so the worker nodes came back online. So the first thing that you know, one of the follow-up scripts does or the, uh, the monitor scripts is go delete SSH keys in case I deployed these machines in the past. Then it uses SSH to go scan the machines and get the new keys and it adds that to my known host file. And now we're just basically in a phase where I'm waiting for my cluster operators to be all in line. I'm also looking for uh, certificate signing requests that need to be handled. So there's some procedural junk that needs to happen. But by and large, clusters deployed, 
it's just making itself pretty at this time. Um, it would look exactly identical to this if you were using libvert, doing it all on one machine. Um, I'd say an all-in-one, you could probably squeeze into about 32 gigs of RAM, uh, but you could run into timing performance problems that would look like other symptoms and cause the install to fail. Uh, 64 gigs of RAM, I think, is probably a more realistic minimum for I want to play with OpenShift as, a, as an all-in-one. But it depends. You know, 4.6, like I said, you can deploy that with just three machines. So three times eight, 16, yeah, you're still close. All right, so once this is done, we'll see about logging into our cluster. So I guess something else that's worth talking about now for OpenShift, if you want me to um, diverge a little bit and fill the air. Um, the way OpenShift works um, is every project in OpenShift or every application in OpenShift uh, is, expor is exported as a application domain. So, um, and forgive me if I get the, if I get this wrong, I'm not a developer, but basically the project name dot apps dot cluster name dot example dot com is the URL how you would access the application in your OpenShift cluster. That's kind of the default way that things in the cloud work. Um, you can change that through automation so that, you know, if you're working in a, um, a production environment and you don't want apps.cluster name, you know, you want to have app.company.com, provided either you hand configure your load balancer to export that name or you've got some form of automation that runs in there and it configures the load balancer when that app comes online or goes offline, what have you. The easiest way is you just set up a DNS wildcard so that anything that says, you know, asterisk.apps.clustername.example.com, anything there gets resolved to my load balancer. And then the load balancer basically unpacks the URL and says, oh, this application is running on that worker node. Let me connect you. So the load balancer basically takes care of how do I get my ingress, my incoming connection, connected with my container that's running inside my cloud. So load balancer makes that, I mean, sorry, the wildcard DNS makes that exceptionally easy for home lab and POCs or developer use. In production, you're probably gonna be more focused on automation and managing certificates and things like that. That's a whole different story. All right. Um, here's what, let's go ahead and take a look and see what's going on here. So I'm going to let this run. Let's switch over to another console. All right. So I'm in, let's just, I don't have to be in this directory. Uh, I'm just going to SSH over to my bastion. So, so SSH bastion dot sp4 rev dot uh, part of my deployment process is the uh, the boot ISO was configured with the SSH key from my host here. So I'm in, no password. So it makes it nice that, you know, as part of automation, the last thing you want to do is put passwords into your automation stuff. If that's not the way you want to go and you have a, a you know, you want to use Ansible Vault or some other form of uh, credential security, um, you know, it's not that hard to change. Okay, so on my Bastion server now, and I talked earlier about this idea, this creds dir. So on my Bastion server, if I CD to, and this is the default, and again, you can change it all through a variable. If I change to OSP dash cluster name in roots home directory, this is where a lot of the artifacts of my deployment kind of get dumped. Um, you have these things here called the ignition files. That's kind of like kickstart for Red Hat Core OS. It's uh, metadata that says your hard drive is SDA and your boot disk is this. And then here's all these other parameters on how you configure the cluster. But the most important thing here is that this auth directory, that there's these two files here. One's called the kube config. So we can cat kube config because that's just an environment variable. And it basically says, oh, here's my, you know, this is my kube config data. So I do an export of 
to config equals, and I'm just going to shorthand it. So now I've basically put my security certificate into an environment variable. And now I can say OC get nodes. And OC is the command line tool for OpenShift. And I can see are my nodes and what status they're in, what version they're running. Uh, I can do an OC uh, get cluster operators. It's like the second thing you want to do. And I can see there's my cluster operators. And they're all true at this point. So my, my script is my Ansible playbook is actually probably done by now. Um, but the the console, this is what's going to provide the um, the web interface to OpenShift. So um, now I forgot the command to get the actual URL. Uh, I'll find it in a second. It's in my documentation. But uh, let's see here, because it, it gives me the ports and everything else. I oh, will come back to it. No, nope, we're going to look it up. So let's go to here. Let's go to here. And then let's go to Come on. That's how to get it installed. So most I have not updated these documents from uh, over the holidays yet. So these these may still refer to the old uh, WS deploy. Um, how to connect, workshop. Nope, that's not what I want. First time login. Okay, browser. Nope. Yeah, let's just try it. I'll come back to it later if we have more time. So I think I'm going to, since we only got, what, five minutes left, I'll go ahead and conclude here. I'll let anybody ask any questions. Let me know what you think. Do you find this useful? Would you use XTOF deploy for another project? I mean, the, the most difficult thing you would have to do is write that, that glue YAML file, which you can just take a copy from one of my other projects and probably just massage it to work. But this is a nice, convenient way to deploy a, a collection of virtual machines that serve a purpose. Yeah, it definitely looks interesting. So some of the things that I noticed uh, are, like, it sounds like there's some limitations in Ansible, or at least, you know, the design of how Ansible works versus some of the other pro products. Now, I know, I know it's a Red Hat product, so you kind of have to use it, but... Um, do you think some of it might be easier with a declarative tool like Terraform or something like that, as opposed to something where you're telling it uh, procedurally what to do? Uh, I would. Ha I don't have any ex practical experience with Terraform. I'd have to say oh. probably yes, because you know I'm using an automation tool um, th that's, you know, it, it's work. I found a way to make it consistent. Um, I can certainly see everything that's going on. It's, it, it is kind of more like a, a Turing machine, right? It's, it's a bunch of states of I'm moving from one state to the next. I am validating right. true or false, and then I keep moving forward based on the success of the previous state. Um, but everything that I've needed to accomplish so far has worked out pretty well. And the nice thing is, is I don't have to learn Terraform or another complicated tool, because once I have now the foundational understanding of how Ansible works and thinks, I can pretty close to solve almost any imaginable problem. And you know, I'm trying to, the, the most difficult problem here is I'm trying to do actions for a machine that doesn't exist yet, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm giving a lot of baby showers before the baby's born. And uh, I, I need a, you know, I, I need a gift list and things like that. So that's kind of where using the delegate to allows me to, to process information for a machine before it actually exists. And I do that on my box that's provisioning and building the boxes. So once you kind of have that understanding, I mean, let me just, uh, 
I'll show you some of the nastiness here. So let's, I'll give you an example of how, how to do great playbooks that work wonderfully, but then you hate yourself for having done it when you're done. So, um, here's my place. So I talked earlier about the, you know, the modularity and trying to create a bunch of reusable code because I was creating my own loops to, to go and work on machines. Let's start with, the, no, let's not start there. I want to start with liver where I deploy task block. Okay. So here I have a task block. And so I, I use that terminology because I, I used uh, import or include tasks inside of a block. But basically I'm looping and then I have to create all these other variables that I'm passing into these other blocks. And this doesn't look all that complicated. Okay, that's doable. Um, let's look at uh, part one. So now I'm inside the actual deployment pass task block and you'll see I'm, I'm, I'm leveraging host vars, which is a special variable. So basically this is the dictionary where th this has all the variables for all the machines. So if I'm working in one machine, but I want to access the variable for a, a, you know, a namespace that belongs to a different machine, I can get to it through host vars. It's like, oh, that's cool. So now I could just have a set of plays that work on Bastion and I'll just loop through the inventory hosts and the hosts that belong to each you know, group and junk like that. And so now I created my own looping structures and you'll see that it just, it spins out of control and some variables, you know, and I'm not a programmer. So, you know, I'm using square brackets with quotes, square brackets without quotes. In some cases I'm using dots and not square brackets. And, you know, as a programmer, maybe it makes sense but if I'm not a programmer and I'm trying to debug a syntax error and trying to find a missing quote, it's like, do I need to quote this or do I not need to quote this? It just created a lot of stress and drama for me to go shoot a problem down of why my playbook fails or why I'm not getting a variable. I'm getting the reference to the variable, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It just drove me nuts. I can see that. I can see that. Right. So, you know, using the Ansible native way, now my variables, in, let me find some another horrible. Here you go. Here's where I'm basically, and this is, this is precisely why I did it this way, is because up here, yeah, it doesn't look so bad. They all have nice single names. I'm just using the double parentheses. Well, it's because I, I remapped all the horrible variables to local nice variables. And so every one of my blocks, I have, I've got this vars where I'm constantly saying this variable equals that variable. So that made the, the writing of the code a little bit cleaner to make sure that I'm not getting the variable name wrong. But good Lord, you come here and you look at this and I'm like, oh, boy, did that, you know, why did I do that this way? And I was like, that doesn't make sense. Whereas now the first thing that the... Uh, the first thing that the playbook does, let's go look into the roles. Uh, deploy. We look at tasks. Right, and this is, this is the cool thing, is that the point of entry to a role is main.yaml. And so now if we look at main.yaml, the first thing that it does is it loads the config variable. So it's gonna, you know, besides master config dot, uh, that YAML, that's, that's passed to the Ansible playbook. When you first call, you know, at the very front end of the system, when you run the shell script, it's doing an Ansible playbook dash I, which is where's my inventory file, and then specifies the config master underscore config dot YAML. Um, that's instantiation of Ansible. Now we're running. So the first thing main.yaml does is it goes and finds the other config file or the other config files, this one here called XSoft deploy and the other one, which is our credentials file. And remember credentials was encrypted. So when we do the first thing it says is what's your credentials and you type in your password, it decrypts it. So it's available for, for inclusion here. Um, then it basically now uh, it loads those variable files. So it looks for them first and then it loads them. 
with a include vars. Um, oh, no, these are the vars that are inside the role, sorry. So inside the role, there are additional files for my resource profiles, the Harper profiles, and the Kickstart profiles. But then the first thing that the actual playbook does is it takes the XTOF deploy config parameters and it merges them into XTOF deploy. So anything you define in the config will supersede the default value. But in the end, what you're left with is one tree or one dictionary that has all your values in it. So when you're writing your code, now it just becomes a nice sequential XTOF deploy dot kickstart dot profile name dot 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 dot. And it's really easy to debug and look at. Um, I have, as part of my default configuration, and this is kind of a, a customer thing. Um, most customers, when they deploy systems, any excess disk space winds up in slash home. So it's usually easiest for me to set up a ISO directory in a temp directory in slash home than it is to use var temp or something like that, where now if I consume all the disk space, if they didn't separate var temp, I've just consumed all the root and who knows what problems there are. So I use slash home. It's a parameter. It's easy to change if you don't like it. Um, but in slash home slash temp, you'll see that there's a, a directory that's created for my cluster. And then there's a directory for every node in the cluster. So I can go into the bastion host. And then all that's left here is the artifacts directory. And that's because the cleanup ran. So the cleanup went and basically deleted the, uh, the unpacked ISO and parameters like that. But inside the artifacts directory, I can look at the ISO Linux config.cfg. So I can see what were the kernel parameters that this ISO was configured with so that I can verify, did it actually get the right network address, the net mask, all these other parameters, like these are all passed in and down to every step of the process from the config files that you generate at the very beginning. So this is kind of a, a, a way I like to do stuff is that I've got, you know, some things you can do with Ansible just built right in, but the minute I get into a lot of variables and parameters, I like using a template and creating a reusable file so that if for whatever reason, I don't, you know, if, I don't want to have to go through the playbooks. Maybe I just want to redeploy the machine. I can come over here to the artifacts directory and I can look at the, oh, here's the command that I ran to generate that ISO image. I can just run that command by hand because that's all, that's all Ansible did is it just ran the shell to generate that ISO image. Um, I can look at the kickstart config, for example, that's here. So that's what was embedded in the CD for how do I boot you? There's my SSH key that get, that get dropped that got dropped under this through a template. So a lot of things, you know, can you improve them from an Ansible perspective and just do it with a native module? Sure, but then the the residual debuggy. I want to, you know, maybe I want to deploy this machine with a, a UEFI instead of a, a BIOS style QMU, you know, boot process. Well, it'd be easier just to come here to where I did the vert install and let's just do that instead. So if this was a libvert machine, you would have all the vert install commands and stuff like that left in these artifact directories. So you can basically go debug and see what went wrong. You can instantly inspect. Did I have the right values? Oh, that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, artifacts. Shoot, I think this development tree doesn't have the very latest version of the role because I don't see. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Yes, the XTOF deploy dictionary. Whoops. So, like I said, at the very beginning, everything gets dumped into this one dictionary. And so, that would say XTOF deploy at the top, and here are my parameters, right? Cleanups turned on, debugs turned on. Here's all the variables associated with the deploy host, all the variables associated with the hardware profile. And so this is this is another thing that I liked about this, right? Um, as part of the previous generation, I had you know a, a, a global variable called you know G or uh, what was it H underscore uh, resource prof RS prof, and then based on that. In the, in the logic of the code, I would then have to basically create a long variable string, substitute in the resource profile to extract the, do I want a sparse disk or not? 
And so every time I referenced a variable, I had to create the entire path to that data. This merging process allows me to just forget all of the other all the other hardware profiles. It only links in the profile that belongs to this machine. So now I can go to the inventory host namespace and basically say, just say XTOF underscore deploy, my dictionary name, dot hardware profile, dot network, dot model, and I have the variable. I don't care about what the actual definition was anymore. My tree has the values that are related to that particular machine. And the same is true for the Kickstart profile. I don't care about all the other ones. I only care about the ones that deal with this one specific machine. So only that part of the tree got merged in here. So this was a, one of those aha moments when all of a sudden all my coding just, just got insanely easier to, to do. So everything in my playbooks should only refer to XTOF underscore deploy variables except under certain special circumstances. And every time I use a variable, I have to ask myself, like, why am I not using something that's already namespaced and belongs to this machine? Why am I using something that's either a global or some other reason? Like, why, why would I need to do that? So that's that. All right. So Christoph, um, you mentioned uh, before we started about the, uh, when, we're, when we were talking about CentOS, uh, you said the Red Hat had that new thing where you can get like, uh, Okay. Yes, so that was announced today, which is uh, the Red Hat developer subscription. I, I believe it's the Red Hat developer subscription. So I, I, I haven't watched the detailed briefing just yet. This is no, I want to make sure I get it right, but I'm also going to make a non-disclosure that I could be could be completely wrong about this. But my understanding is the Red Hat developer subscription uh, is going to be converted, and I think. They, they set up by latest date of February 1st. So I don't think it's available today in this capacity, uh, but it shouldn't be, you know, another couple of weeks before it is. If you have an account uh, in the Red Hat portal and anybody can sign up for an account in the Red Hat portal, you just go create an account if you don't have one yet. Um, you can get access to a developer subscription, which entitles you to 16 RHEL instances. Um, I don't know how that divides up if it includes virtual machines. Uh, typically, a RHEL entitlement is either one physical machine or two virtuals. Uh, oftentimes, if you have one virtual machine, you can have four VMs uh, with a generic subscription, but that's not RHEL VMs. That's any other OS VMs. Oh. If you need RHEL, then that would consume another, another entitlement. So. Mm -hmm. Live streaming is on. Okay. All good? That sounds pretty good. I wish I could remember the command. Uh, where would I have that? Give me, give me one second. I want to find out. I gotta re it's, it's been such a, you know, it's been over two weeks since the last time I looked at this and I just forgot. So just give me one second. I just want to show you what the OpenShift cluster looks like. I'm sure I have it in my Evernote. Uh, premium. premium. Do I just have to get the details about the cluster operator and then it would tell me where the console is and I could just go right to the URL. All right, I'm beginning to think that that beeping fire alarm might be in my house. That's how good the audio is. Let's see here. Get nodes, get patch, get cluster version, get cluster operators. Da 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 da. da. We start. We cannot hear you, Jerry. Ah, the get routes command. That's what I wanted. So, um, I need to get back to my bastion server. 
I need to get back to my auth directory. Export. Let's see, get routes dash A. And there we see that my OpenShift console is right here. That's really small. Can you make that bigger? No. Yes. <laughs> so that's my so I ran uh, OC get routes dash A. And I see my OpenShift console. So now I can grab the URL here. And so the application that provides the console interface, the web GUI, is console dash OpenShift dash console dot apps dot cluster name dot example dot com. So now if I correctly set up my wildcard in DNS. And this is going to basically, I need to access two different certificates. One for the API and one for the actual thing here. Um, now I have an admin password. And the admin password, that's what's in this other file here. So I can do a cat on cube admin password. And you can see here's this long, nasty string. I copy that, paste that in in the web console. And it doesn't work because I didn't cut and paste it correctly. So admin, or is it kube admin? Kube admin. And I think I need to cut and paste it one more time. All right. Minimize. Ta da! Web shift. Uh, web shift. Open shift. <laughs> Here we have Open shift console. Good to go. We're ready to start having some fun with Kubernetes. All right. Is it beer drinking time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to return to my tile. Do want to thank everybody for spending the evening with me. And now we will adjourn and retire for beer and tech talk or nerd talk. We'll pretend like we're at the, uh, where do we always go? The Cambridge Brewery. Cambridge Brewery.